welcome to today's webinar, Architectural Styles. My name is Cindy Heitzman. I'm the Executive Director of the California Preservation Foundation. Before we begin, I would like to run through a couple of options for you. Please uh, indicate your audio option, which is in the toolbar at the right of your screen. Please select whether you are listening by telephone or microphone and speakers. The format for today's 90-minute webinar will include a presentation by Dr. Diane Kane, followed by a question and answer session. Attendees can ask questions by typing them in the question box at the lower part of the toolbar and submitting them to uh, just submitting them. And we will answer your questions at the end of the session. Our speaker is Dr. Diane Kane. Diane is recently retired from the City Planning Community Investment Department at the City of San Diego, where she handled large-scale historic surveys as part of the long-range planning process. Previously, she was the Heritage Resources Coordinator for Caltrans District 7 in Los Angeles, where she handled Section 106 and CEQA review of historic properties. As, quote, mother of the Arroyo Seco Parkway National Scenic Byway in Los Angeles, she has had extensive experience with large-scale cultural landscape documentation and treatment issues. She is a professor of architectural history at the New School of Architecture in San Diego and has taught architectural history and planning at several Southland universities, including San Diego State University, University of California at Los Angeles, and Cal Poly Pomona. Diane is a trustee of the California Preservation Foundation and is a frequent contributor to CPF conferences and workshops. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diane Kane. Well, thank you, Cindy. I'm, I'm very excited to be here and uh, having such a broad audience statewide. I would be, I'll be speaking for the next maybe hour and 15 minutes on the top 25 architectural styles in the state of California. I'd like to start by making a few disclaimers. The first is I cannot talk about everything in an hour and 15 minutes. So if your favorite style or your favorite building is not included in the lecture, please don't feel disgruntled. There is only so much I could include. I've tried to include examples of various types of buildings from high style to vernacular and various, uh, various types of um, uses in these buildings. So you can see how these styles manifest across a broad range of building types. The other thing I would like to note is that I'm going to be stopping the lecture around 1970. We are dealing primarily with historical properties here for uh, survey purposes. So I will not be going into the more contemporary styles. Some of that is because I simply do not have time. So that's where I chose to terminate the, uh, the discussion. I guess the last thing I would like to, to discuss with you is choice of terminology. And I'm sure we will have plenty of opportunity for discussion uh, after, after the lecture as far as to how one refers to one style versus another. Now to come up with the terms that I will be using in this lecture, I've used a variety of guidebooks. There are several of them out there. The one that seems to be most widely used, at least in San Diego, where I live, is McAllister and McAllister's Field Guide to Architecture. However, the, the, the uh, nomenclature that I have used throughout my career which I have found the most useful for California, come from my mentor, Dr. David Gebhardt, who is the professor of architectural history at UC Santa Barbara, where I did my doctoral dissertation. I found that David was right on in his two groundbreaking guidebooks on architecture in California. The first one dealing with Northern California architecture and the second dealing with Southern California architecture. There are wonderful style glossaries in the back of both books, and I would highly recommend them for those of you who are doing field work in California. I think 
his material is the best tailored to what we have in the state. And those of you who are doing large-scale surveys are most likely adding to his insight and refining some of his um, comments for your particular locality. And I congratulate all of you for carrying on the work he started many, many years ago. Um, I will, and I'd like to dedicate this lecture to him since it was his first guidebook, which came out in 1973, that inspired me to become an architectural historian and eventually make my way to Santa Barbara to study with him. So let's get started. Uh, what I would like to do is divide California history into basically, I will be talking about three different periods of time dealing with different parts of the state. The first period, which really encompasses the entire state, is the, the period of the California missions, which is probably the only building type that is consistent throughout the state of California. We were initially colonized by the Spanish. All of our architectural influences are coming up to California through Mexico. And they start where I currently live in San Diego down in, 19, uh, in, in 1769. And you can see us uh, right here at the uh, bottom of the state as the Spanish then proceed northward. And they get all the way up to San Francisco and then start working their way back and infilling with the various missions. Now, both mission style and the subsequent period, the Rancho period, once the missions uh, break up, are dominated by a method of building as much as a style, and that is dealing with the material of adobe. So with both missions and with the uh, rancho, I'm going to be looking at materials as well as style. Let's start off with uh, an example of a mission here. Uh, this one down in San Diego, Mission San Luis Rey. The other thing I'm going to note here is I'm not going to be stressing names, dates, or architects to any great extent. You'll be seeing them on the screen. What I'm really going to be focusing on is the stylistic um, elements. So you'll get some sense of vocabulary and a, a way to train your eye visually. And if you have questions about any specific building part, I would highly recommend acquiring a good architectural dictionary where you can look terms up. That really helps quite a bit. OK, so let's get started here with Mission San Luis Rey. The, uh, the Spanish, as they're coming up through Mexico, are really bringing along with them a Spanish colonial architecture that is already being built in Mexico uh, from a few centuries earlier. And this is rather watered down stuff from Spain. So let's take a look at some of our character-defining features. This is the ranch show in its uh, first phase, I'm sorry, the, uh, the mission. And we can see that it's a very square, blocky building. It has what's called an espadaña roof line to it, which is this curly Q pediment, uh, a freestanding bell tower, uh, I'm sorry, an attached bell tower. And it really wanted to have two towers, we can see the base of one here over to the left, but no superstructure. Many of these did not get finished on the missions, or some of them fell down in earthquakes. So they were intended all to have two towers flanking a central area, but we don't have them in most cases. The tower, as you can see, is stacked, and it has nice cornice lines and is capped by a small dome. Uh, let's take a look at some additional features here. You know what? You know what? Hmm. All right. I apologize. I had a very good slide here that's not coming up, so we'll just go with this one. Uh, they're made out of very thick wall adobe, which are mud bricks that were stacked, sun-dried and stacked. Quite often, they had stone foundations. Now, the foundations were made out of local rubble. And in many cases, the stone wasn't of terribly high quality. There was a very, uh, very 
small percentage of people who understood how to build in stone among the Mexicans that were coming forward up through California, and certainly the, the Native American Indians had no tradition of building in stone. So the missions were hand-built by the uh, Native Americans and were um, supervised by the Spanish coming up through California. So they're using what they can find as they're building, and that tends to be mud and local stone. Wood is used quite sparingly, particularly in Southern California, because we just don't have a lot of it. And that tends to restrict the scale of some of the buildings, predominantly the, the width. If you look across here, the nave portions of most of these uh, missions are really no more than about 25 feet, because that was the height of the trees that could be felled in order to provide supporting roof beams. So the walls are load-bearing adobe. They're battered, which means they are sloped at the base, and they become slightly tapered as they are pulled up. And they are given a coat of lime plaster, which preserves them. We're going to have some, um, some very vestigial and thin classical detailing that is derived from the Spanish Baroque and some uh, latent Renaissance elements. So we can see that here with pilasters that are flanking uh, the main uh, facade of the building. Uh, we have a projecting cornice, which gives us a little bit of definition at the roof line, also provides a bit of water protection to the walls. And then uh, we have inset niches. These would have been uh, set, uh, embellished with sculpture an oculus window right on center. So we have right here down the middle of our building a, um, a, a, a line that provides us a symmetrical balanced composition. And then a lot more classical detailing right around the door here with pilasters uh, around upholding an arch over our wooden door. And then another set of larger engaged pilasters uh, providing additional emphasis to the door. The missions were actually complexes that had uh, a, they were they're essentially uh, small cities that had as their focus a church, but also all of the workspaces needed to keep civilization going in the outback. The major aspect of the of the, the footprint of the missions was something called a quadrangle, which was the workspace was enclosed on four sides by these arched arcades that you can see here at the mission. And then here's, here's a good uh, restoration photograph of the um, front of our building. The interiors, again, as I noted, are, were quite narrow. They were um, most often roofed particularly in the elongated nave section with wood. And then occasionally at the crossing, they would have a stone dome. This one here is octagonal. It's not exactly round, as would have been the case in Europe. The interiors were embellished with their white line plaster and then hand painted uh, using stencils uh, in very bright colors that were appealing to the Native Americans. We're standing underneath the choir loft. These would have been directly over the uh, door as you entered into a small narthex. And then the floors, here you can see is tiled, but uh, initially they would have been rammed earth. Uh, the altar is a step-up affair, and then we would have a very large burritos out of wood that would have been carved and um, embellished with various uh, statues of saints. Now here's a plan of the quadrangle. Now, this is quite important because it gives us the hollow square courtyard that becomes part and parcel of the architecture we have in California today. Uh, we have a convento, which was where the monks lived, and then all of the various activities going on here to keep the community going. 
such as an infirmary, a refectory. Uh, the Native American women were also living in the, uh, in the missions, as well as they would have storerooms and workrooms. And then the courtyard was a workspace. Here's a small model of what the mission would have looked like. Uh, it's comprised of both public and private spaces. The public space being the church and the cemetery for Christian burials, and the private space being for uh, the monks. Now, surrounding the missions were vast holdings of land that were uh, additional areas to support the mission. And these would have included orchards, grain fields, vineyards, and so forth, as well as extensive water supply systems, both for storing and delivering water. We would have had some uh, uh, kiln activity here to create the lime mortar, as well as um, wash basins for cleaning. Now the ranchos carry on the same quadrangle tradition as we see in the, in the missions. This period is fairly long and it's fairly transitional. The earlier ranchos are using the same adobe construction that we see in the, the missions. The later ones, particularly after 1850 with the American period, begin incorporating mass-produced materials that they're getting uh, through uh, connections with the East Coast. So we have um, some elements that are Spanish and some that are American, which is why this is in many places called territorial or transitional architecture. Hmm. Okay. Okay, now this one has two quadrangles. The quadrangles were actually not always built because they were um, expensive and took a long time. But again, they are defensive. The, uh, inner, the first courtyard we have here is the carriage court, and this is the workspace. You can see the very thick walls for the adobe. All of the rooms are entering out into the courtyard, which is your circulation space as well as your workspace. And then we can see a very uh, def defensive door with a massive overhang um, added later. You can see the milled boards here for uh, protecting people from the sun and from various uh, other types of weather that we occasionally get down here in San Diego. Here we have a very large door. You can see how massive that is and you really get the sense of of protection and enclosure uh, on the um, inside versus the outside. Now the living spaces in the ranchos were again surrounding a courtyard patio. Uh, so quite often this would also be a place for growing flowers, having your well or your water supply, as well as maybe some uh, herbs and vegetables. And here's an absolutely beautiful garden at Rancho Guajome in San Diego. The floor plan is one room deep all the way around the courtyard. Most of the rooms access the courtyard directly, but some of them also access one another, as you can see in this particular area, through what's called an enfilade floor plan. This means that the rooms are connected to one another internally with no hallway. Now we also have a later addition here which is a glazed porch. And this, this shows you the transition in this particular location between the earlier period and the later period. Part of what makes this transitional is the second story. The early ranchos were all single story. They were adobe. The adobe walls needed to be very thick to support a superstructure. The superstructure here is in wood, and you can see some of the manufactured windows, plate glass, one over one, double hung. Here's the exterior of that um, arcade that was added later. You can see it's using the arches of the mission style. Uh, the, this is the infill area. This is on the other side facing the courtyard, 
you can see the flooring. We now have milled flooring. We have mass-produced doors, wood paneled, um, wooden roofs. Again, very narrow spaces because of the lack of wood. Deeply inset windows because of the thickness of the adobe walls. Multi-pane glass, very thin muntins here putting the windows together, and handmade tiles. These were normally uh, draped over your knee and hand patted into place and then baked in that U-shape in the sun. On the interiors, we begin to get brick fireplaces and uh, furnishings made from um, milled wood. Here's uh, another shot of that courtyard uh, patio. The overhangs in a number of these buildings were again added later. You can see the milled wood and the porch uh, supports. And then here the uh, tile on the interior and the vast amount of glazing. This is obviously very late uh, 19th century. Now the first American styles we begin to get are coming from the East Coast. We'll start with the Monterey or the Greek Revival. Probably the best example of Greek Revival in California is the very brief California State Capitol, which dates from right after we joined the Union, 1852. This is a very latent style here in California. Greek Revival was going on in the rest of the country from our nation's foundations. So the very um, vestigial elements we have here are just these two s solitary Greek uh, Doric columns that are supporting a lintel under a pediment with uh, a very blocky building and engaged pilasters on either side uh, supporting an entablature. The Monterey Revival is, to some extent, coinciding with the Greek Revival in California because of the um, addition here of the second story that we get once we become part of the Union. Here's a number of Monterey Revival buildings from Monterey, and uh, they have a number of these uh, blends of adobe, uh, rancho, and American uh, machined products to them. Here's probably the best example of a Greek Revival pediment where you can really see that overlap between the Monterey Revival and the Greek Revival. Uh, not clearly understood because we've got a post here uh, right in the middle of our two uh, exterior columns. This would not have been done in a, a very authentic Greek Revival rendition. And then finally, the last tradition we have from the very early period of our founding is the board and batten single wall construction, uh, mining buildings and outbuildings such as barns and sheds and the various uh, work-related simple buildings of the first wave of settlement here in California. These buildings are very simply put together. They have no structural framing. The best way to explain how they're put together is to think about a deck of cards. If any of you have ever tried to build a, a, a house out of a deck of cards, that's exactly the way these are done. We can see you have a, a floor uh, section here with your planks, your floorboards. Your wall boards are put in individually. They're the um, seams between the woods are sealed over with battens, and then you have a, a barge board. Uh, I'm sorry, you've got a. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, you've got a framing piece here, and then your roof uh, elements are just dovetailed together. They're bird mouthed over the support system, and then they're mitered here at the top with no ridge beam. Here's a detail of how the floor is put together and how the uh, walls and ceilings are joined. Now, needless to say, these buildings are not terribly stable, and they had a tendency to rack or implode, which is why we don't have a lot of them around anymore. 
Hmm. Okay, now as we get into the American period, a lot of our styles are coming from England. England is at the height of its powers globally, and they are receiving ideas from all over the globe. Most of these are coming into America, where colonial power, uh, we're getting stuff from the East Coast, and certainly once California is connected via the railway, uh, we begin getting ideas quite quickly. Now here's a, a quick chart that will give you an idea of what's going on in England versus uh, Queen Victoria. We tend to call everything in uh, California from the time we entered the Union up to about 1900 Victorian. But as I'll point out, many of these are really not Victorian styles. Uh, the railroad is highly influential in spreading ideas. We can see it's in England as early as the 1820s. Doesn't get to California until 1869 in San Francisco, LA 1876, and 1885 once we're down here in San Diego. So ideas are spreading from the east now down from San Francisco to the southern portion of the state. We tend to get a lag period then in these various styles with the earlier periods, the earlier styles from England showing up in Northern California but not arriving in Southern California until quite late. Now here's the styles we tend to associate with the Victorian period, a Gothic Revival, Italianate, Second Empire, Folk Victorian, Stick Style, Queen Anne, and Shingle Style. But many of these are not actually from England. Which ones are not? Well, uh, the this one, Second Empire, is not. The Stick Style is not. The Shingle Style is not. And the Queen Anne is quite different here than in England. So let's take a look at where these things are actually coming from. Okay, um, many of them are coming also from France. And here's an idea of what's going on in France versus what is going on in England. England has a full-blown Gothic revival, whereas most of the classical elements are coming in from France. This is associated with the École de Beaux Art, which was a very well uh, thought out and rather um, assembly line method of teaching design in Paris. So certainly by the 1860s, any American architect who wants to be taken seriously is studying in Paris. And they are learning this technique to churn out very large scale buildings that are more often than not classically flavored. So the Gothic elements are coming from England, the classical elements are coming from France. In America, we tend to blend them all together. And it gets worse when we get to California, because we're so far away from all of these various influences. One of the ways that these ideas are being disseminated is through pattern books. And the first and one of the most popular was done by uh, Andrew Jackson Downing, published in 1850 called The Architecture of Country Homes. The Italianate style, which we associate with the Victorian period, was really uh, mostly disseminated through pattern books. Uh, this, this is characterized by blocky, irregular massing, low-pitched roofs, square towers, corbel detailing, which you can see here. This is called a corbel table, arched loggias, and round-headed windows, which you see here. Some good examples in California, up here in Chico, the Bidwell Mansion. This is known as the Villa Style. It's a freestanding mansion 
with a central tower. It's quite regular in its massing. It's really very boxy. It has a wonderful porch that goes all the way around it with a walk on, walkway on the second floor, huge windows that I have segmentally arched tops to them, uh, brackets under the eaves, and then this little rounded uh, corner element in the rear. Quite wonderful example of the Italianate villa style. It's also well found in commercial areas. Here's a small one in San Diego. The up top uh, wants to be symmetric. You can see the pediment here over the top floor. However, the door is uh, in a totally different spot. The top and the bottom don't seem to be relating well to one another. And then we have this element added later. This is a separate building. You can see they've carried over the Italianate detailing in this bay, but it's totally different on the bottom. Here's a very uh, vernacular version of the Italianate, characterized only by this corbel table and bracketed um, pediments over the windows. We've lost all of the uh, symmetrical massing, and this is obviously done in wood rather than stone. Here's a high style example from San Francisco. Uh, in stone, some other details that uh, we're able to carry out here are these wonderful coins on the corner and a tremendous amount of detailing around the openings. And then look at the, this wonderful corbel table here under the cornice line, projecting quite far from the facade of the building. Uh, some additional Italianate examples up in Northern California. This one in Red Bluff uh, over a cast iron porch area that's being shaded, uh, recessed and shaded commercial buildings, meeting hall up top. So the Italianate was extremely popular in commercial areas and was uh, found all over the state. There are probably many of these examples still existing in Main Street programs today. Second Empire style, again, is coming from France. This is associated with the additions to the Louvre from around 18, 1860. Has extreme vertical orientation, as all Victorian styles do. They're all quite um, uh, vertical. And you pick this up primarily in the windows. You see these very long, tall windows. Again, one over one double hung. In this example, they are paired. And then we have, again, a projecting cornice held on coupled brackets. And then the, the character-defining feature that really calls this out is Second Empire, which is the high mansard roof. This, these can have concave or convex sides and are always topped by a flat uh, roof with, uh, if you have the funds, very ornate cast iron. Uh, railings. These can be either symmetric or asymmetric, as you see in this example. Here we have a central tower uh, flanked by side, uh, side units, this one sort of stepping back, and again that wonderful surrounding porch uh, characteristic of a suburban mansion. Another freestyle, uh, freestanding example. Here you can really pick up that mansard roof, this time with sloping uh, eaves and a very high pointed uh, turret, a projecting porch set up on a rusticated stone base. And then it's got these side bays here, which is kind of mixing it in with the Queen Anne. Uh, these these uh, styles do get um, comp compiled in America. Uh, another feature are these dormers that are poking out through the mansard roof. We can pick up the Second Empire style in commercial buildings. This is the Autofred building in San Francisco. And again, that characteristic mansard roof will tell you what's going on. Three stories. Here's our corner coins. 
We've got a, a, a string course here that's going over our windows, uh, held up by uh, those, uh, some voussoirs right on uh, center of our doubled windows. Again, tall proportions to the windows. A much fancier example here in this uh, wonderful little uh, in-town in house that is attached, rusticated base, quite uh, ornate uh, balconies here that are, are corbelled out from the main body of the building, uh, decorative cast iron railings on two stories. This looks kind of Rococo in its, uh, its detailing and again the projecting cornice. So here's a, a simple example over here, a very ornate uh, Rococo-like example in different building types. Now the East Lake stick style is a third example of Victorian buildings. They are they are conflated to some extent, and they are outgrowths of two different uh, theories in uh, Victorian architecture. One is coming from John Ruskin, which is talking about truth in materials and truth in design, where it is considered noble and virtuous to have these structural elements of your building displayed so people can see how it's standing up. Now, this isn't always the way these buildings were constructed. However, uh, this architect, in this, in this example, and this is from the East Coast in a pattern book, is trying to indicate uh, to the viewer exactly how this building is constructed. You can see a better example here in this pattern book, which is showing balloon framing one of the American inventions from the Industrial Revolution that comes out of Chicago, where we begin to use very uh, thin pieces of milled wood that are prefabbed and sent by train all over the United States. So this plays into the stick style as well as with Ruskinian theories. The character defining features are going to be very thin, tenuous, and highly vertical volumes. Uh, the surface divided into panels. And I have an example where I'll show you that shortly. The in, within those panels, you're going to have a vast number of siding types. Here's some of the possibilities. And what this is doing is showing off what saw cut wood can do. So it's part and parcel of the, um, the mechanical and industrial revolution. Another aspect is jigsaw and lath work. So we have all these really cool power tools that we can use with our wood cutting, and we're going to display those now on our buildings. Uh, we can use cutout ornaments and drill holes and turned uh, spindles. So we're going to see all sorts of exciting uh, elements showing up to, ornate, to ornament our buildings, uh, particularly a terrific example of this is the Sherman Gilbert House in San Diego. Again, look at that very late date because of the lag in time. Uh, you can get this sense of structure with this tower. It's sort of tenuous, uh, tenuously supported uh, pyramidal roof with the flared eaves and open brackets. You can also see that in the stair railing. You get that sense of thinness. This almost looks like it wants to topple over, and that's partially because of the inset porches that are, that are protecting the doors here. We have some bracket supports in the corners, and then here's an example of the uh, panels that are separating out the various uh, components of the facade's organization. We have some spindle work up in the, uh, the eaves right at the apex, and these are going to be turned. Let's take a look at some details. You can get a better shot of that. Here's the cutouts and the barge boards. Look at all of the wood that we have here cut out and um, ornamented. Here's the drill holes, the, the um, various cutout ornaments, sawtooth sharp edges. 
Here's again that panel, some diagonal sheathing, and the spindle work railing. Quite ornate. East Lake stick style. Here's an example of the same style in a train station. This one in Menlo Park. Now the Queen Anne is probably one of the most popular styles throughout the state because by the time it came into popularity we do have train connections to throughout the entire state. So this one spreads like wildfire. It comes right on the heels of the East Lake and all of those wonderful machine-made products that we were seeing in that style. But it is also um, simplified to some extent as we get toward the tail end of the century. And it blends into the colonial revival and the shingle style. The main character defining feature with Queen Anne is going to be this, these uh, round turrets and corner elements. These are highly irregular uh, buildings, basically made up of a series of component parts that are added together. And you can almost read the volumes on the outside of the building as these things are compiled and slammed together. We're going to have very tall chimneys, uh, domes, uh, very ornate porches. Here's some of that turning um, elements in the porch, support, porch supports. Uh, other aspects are projecting oils, bay windows, uh, some classical elements, uh, very ornate barge boards and gables and then of course pattern shingles. Let's take a look at some additional examples around the state. This was used commercially in resort architecture. Many of you are probably familiar with the Hotel Dell in Coronado, probably the best example of uh, resort Queen Anne architecture we have in the state. And here's that turret blown up to absolutely enormous proportions in a freestanding element of the hotel, it's their dining room. Uh, commercial examples from Northern California. Uh, we have here the towers and then these wonderful um, projecting uh, elements around the windows here with the, the fretwork, the lathe work, the turns, the corbel supports. Um, quite exciting detailing here all possible with machine products. And finally, the San Francisco row houses, all decked out and uh, today painted within an inch of their lives. Now, as you might feel after having a particularly sweet pastry or dessert, uh, a lot of the Queen Anne properties, again, looking like highly decorated wedding cakes. And after you've had all of that frosting, you really start getting sick and you want something simple. Well, the shingle style answers that need. It begins to simplify the exteriors of these Victorian buildings and tone them down by stripping off the ornament by bringing the color down, by bringing down the details, and instead sheathing the entire surfaces of the buildings with wooden shingles. This particularly fabulous example from Monterey is, uh, even has the corners blurred between the wall surface and the roof. And we have, these are very roofy buildings. They have very low sloping eaves that project quite far. And you can see how that eve detail just curves around over the windows. We're going to see that detail a lot in what are called eyelid dormers that will quite frequently poke through the roof line. We've got some dormer windows here. We could have a rusticated stone base and um, oriel windows are also part of these of this uh, particular style. 
One of the most brilliant practitioners is Ernest Coxhead in the Bay Area, and he and a number of his contemporaries began moving into the shingle style, which comes in from the East Coast. This is an American style that is a throwback to the earliest colonial buildings that were constructed on the eastern seaboard. The, uh, a younger generation of architects uh, who were training with Henry Hobson Richardson began to sketch these buildings and be, uh, start doing updated renditions of them for their clients' seaside bungalows. So this is the era of the Newport Beach Cottage. People are now having free time for recreation, and they become very informal dwellings, using, in many cases, the Queen Anne massing, but all of the detailing is replaced with shingles. You can see a good example of it here in the Cedar Gable Inns in Napa, where this could be a Queen Anne house, but we're starting to smooth the various components of the massing out and covering it all with this thin skin of shingles. Uh, we're going to very small pane windows, introducing some classical detailing. This is particularly true on the East Coast, where this style blends into the American colonial revival. On the West Coast, that doesn't happen to, to as great of an extent. That is partially because the group of architects who are enamored of this style are really using it as their expression of the arts and crafts. And they are uh, combining it with the vocal building tradition in California of those wooden single wall construction buildings I was showing you earlier at Bodie. Uh, and they are also looking at vernacular structures as barns and sheds and the various outbuildings that are dotting the rural California landscape. So they are doing on the West Coast what their counterparts on the East Coast are doing in mining the vernacular history of their locality to make it a regional statement and something that is specifically and particularly Californian. Uh, we can see some superb examples here, uh, by again, all by Ernest Coxhead. Here's a townhouse, a very simple, boxy a statement with some classical detailings. We have some looks like a, a, a Palladian window, a little bit of an um, off-center balcony over a uh, Baroque-style curved pediment. So we've got a lot of interesting things going on in this building with the very flat, thin windows here that look like they're just poked through the, the uh, facade to give you the sense of a very thin skin, yet these very beefy balcony and door elements that are speaking to classical revival. And then, of course, in Ernest Coxhead's own home, the very high-pitched uh, roof here is reminiscent of a Gothic Revival profile. And this, uh, this, could be, this could fit very nicely back on the East Coast with some of the types of buildings that were being done by his contemporaries in the Boston and uh, Eastern Seaboard. Now, the shingle style in Southern California is showing up also at the seacoast here in La Jolla uh, in these very seasonal beach cottages. Uh, here's a, a very uh, early one right on La Jolla Cove. You can see it's covered in shingles. It's very simple, uh, very um, small, and initially meant to be temporary. These, these buildings are also being inspired by the Indian Bangala, or bungalow, which was a seasonal dwelling in the countryside of India, where the British would escape to get away from the city in urban heat during the summertime. You can see these are very simple buildings with pyramidal shaped roofs, rather boxy in form, uh, with wide verandas supported on posts. 
and a number of, of these types of buildings start showing up in La Jolla and elsewhere along the California coastline in the late 1890s. You can pick up some of these right here along the coastline. These are still existing and they are historical properties in San Diego. The concept of the seasonal beach cottage gets taken to grandiose proportions by Green and Green in Pasadena with their taking this bungalow concept and uh, embellishing it with Japanese elements and turning it into something that is quintessentially California and very American. So we're starting with the shingle style, we're bringing in elements, the shingle style from the East Coast, we're bringing in elements now from the Pacific Rim, from India, from Japan, and combining them in Southern California into a statement that is purely California. This particular solution is so elegant and so befitting of the time that it is um, created for that it becomes wildly popular and it begins now to spread east and west from California to other parts of the country. So California is no longer a backwater receiving its ideas from other places but has become among the forefront of trendsetters in the, in the country if not in the world. In the uh, green and green version of the California bungalow, we have wide projecting eaves, the very low roof line, extremely extended raptor tails, uh, windows pulled up under the eaves, these very broad porches. Uh, these are ground hugging buildings <coughs> that are using cobblestones and uh, clinker brick in this case for supports and then gorgeously detailed uh, uses of wood and stained glass to um, provide elements that are useful as well as beautiful as is befitting of the craftsman aesthetic. Here's some uh, more humble uh, renditions of the craftsman style. We can see on these more middle class examples and we have now a middle class. Uh, porches being one of the most characteristic features. Uh, so the gable, these are very roofy buildings again. Here's that pyramidal roof that we saw in the Indian bungalow with a gabled entrance to the porch supported on piers. These are often battered. Here's another example down here. You can pick up the cobblestone foundations. Uh, normally one-story buildings, but not always. You can see the two-story here, but a profusion of gables, projecting raptor tails, and so forth. All of our decorations are going to be practical. We're going to see them a lot with decorative metal hardware and in the window and door arrangements. Quite often you will see a mixture of siding on these materials, uh, calling out the various pieces of the building. We can have shingles, we can have clapboards, we can have um, stucco or brick. The craftsman style also manifests in churches. I don't know what there is about Berkeley, but Berkeley is one of the major uh, centers of the craftsman style in California, Pasadena being the other. So in Northern California, here are two ex expert essays by Bernard Maybach and Julia Morgan of a craftsman uh, style, if you will, in a church. And I think you would agree these are both highly spiritual places, speaking to the locale, the function of the building, and the honest expression of materials. Now, concurrent with the arts and crafts, we have something known as Bo the Beaux Arts period. I'm going to. I am a lumper with the way I do architectural styles, so I'm going to lump a whole slew of classical revival styles together under Beaux Arts classicism. 
In several books you might see this period referred to as the American Renaissance. It's also associated with something known as the city beautiful. And the uh, components here are grand architectural statements. So most of the buildings using these um, components are going to be major civic buildings, major commercial buildings. The, uh, the styles are mixed. They can be anything from the Roman Imperial period up through the Parisian Neo-Baroque. We're going to see a lot of classical detailings and over-the-top use of sculpture. Very heavy um, uses of all of the ornamentation, rusticated plinths and coins, and then these things are just decorated out the wazoo, the sculpture and inscriptions. And here's the building types that we would expect to see them in. So here's some examples I'm sure you're all familiar with. Bernard Maybeck doing this wonderful confection and plaster and staff for the uh, Panama Exposition and now the um, museum. Here's an office building in San Francisco and of course the phenomenal City Hall in San Francisco. Now the Beaux-Arts uh, style was not just classicism, it was really a way of organizing vast spaces. And where this lines up with the City Beautiful movement is in uh, civic center design and exposition design. One of the best examples was the 1915 Panama Exposition in San Diego, which uh, was again a temporary um, it was supposed to be temporary, but it's been temporary for almost 100 years now. What you're picking up here is this, this wonderful cross axis that unites the entryways of the uh, fairgrounds and the exhibition buildings themselves, which was by design using these uh, components of Beaux-Arts site planning, which are formal geometry, symmetrical design, grand axes, enclosed courtyards, the cross-axial circulation, directed long views, and focal points. And you can certainly see that directed long view here in this arcade. Uh, here's some more directed views. Uh, uh, landscaping is extremely important with this type of, of design because we're, we're designing spaces as well as buildings. So we're getting oblong reflecting pools and of course the details are also important. Here's where a lot of our classically inspired elements show up in pedestals, urns, sculptures, and so forth. One of the best renditions of this happening on an urban scale is the, city, the Civic Center in Pasadena. And here you can see that mixture of classical styles. Everything from the Spanish colonial revival city hall to the Renaissance revival post offices and civic auditorium. And again, a slightly Spanishy looking library. And a wonderfully classically designed bridge. Bridge designs, particularly from this period, often are in the classical uh, style as grand entrances into urban areas. And that's part of the city beautiful uh, tradition. A heart on the heels. Now the craftsman, the craftsman um, style initially begins with mission revival because our craftsman architects are looking at what is indigenous to California. So the Northern Californians begin looking at these board and batten buildings in the landscape, whereas the Southern Californians begin looking at our missions. Uh, as a result, we have the same elements that we discussed earlier with the mission period showing up around the turn of the century in all types of buildings that are trying to turn themselves into many missions. The style was rather short-lived because the mission uh, components were not terribly functional. Uh, probably the thing that, that 
distinguishes most missions style buildings is that Espadaña roof line that we saw in the first slide of the lecture, the arches, and the arcades and, and courtyards. So those elements do carry over and become a, a one, part of the DNA of the architecture of California. But the mission style itself is fairly short-lived. Uh, but, but not before it reaches its apogee out here at the Mission Inn in Riverside. The Mission Inn today is an enormous complex. It was under construction for, almost, for over 30 years. But the mission style component is, is in the earliest phase here. You can see this very long arcade across the front of the building, the uh, courtyard, and the central tower. And there are a number of Espadaña uh, pediments. You can pick one up right here. That, here's, here's the uh, entry to the arcade with that Espadaña, and you can pick it up here with the tower and here in this image. The missions also influenced early modernism in California. Uh, the person most uh, strongly influenced by them was Irving Gill, again in San Diego, where he's picked up the arcade, simplified it, stripped everything off it, uh, gone to stucco here in uh, here in SA in concrete, tilt slab concrete, where we're using modern materials, modern methods, but getting our ideas of design from an indigenous vernacular source. Now, Mission Revival and Irving Gill's career kind of tank with the uh, Spanish uh, colonial revival. A craze which comes in with the San Diego Panama Exposition in 1915. And the person who introduces it to the state is not a Californian. It's Bertram Goodhue, who is brought in from New York to be the main architect of the exposition. It becomes wildly popular and becomes the predominant building style in Southern California, at any rate, during the teens and the twenties, and is still continuing today. So I think we can say that the Spanish heritage is one of the components that makes California architecture Californian. Here's a phenomenal, uh, exuberant display, one of the most idiosyncratic and wonderful buildings in the state, the Santa Barbara Courthouse by William Mosier at the end of the twenties. Uh, we have here asymmetrical massing a low-pitched red tile roof, little or no eave overhang, smooth stucco cladding, your arches and columns carrying over from the Mission Revival. Now a lot of decoration. This is almost like the Queen Anne version of Mission Revival where we're going to be glopping on uh, various details such as ironwork, tile, uh, turn window grills, etc. Uh, here's the building that started it all at the exposition in true full-blown Spanish colonial revival uh, taken from Baroque Spain. Uh, this was the theme, ba theme building in the exposition. Today it is the Museum of Man. And you can see the contrast here between these very stark planar forms and the heavily sculpted ornamental forms uh, fo focused on the doors and the windows and on the bell tower. So this is the grandest Spanish colonial Baroque statement of uh, expression of the style. Let's look at some simpler forms. Uh, here's a wonderful comp uh, element from the 1920s in Santa Barbara, the El Paseo, which is really a composite of several early adobes pulled together with some new construction in order to create an open air shopping experience for uh, individuals along State Street in Santa Barbara. Here's a number of these elements. Here's one of the older adobes, Monterey style, with the uh, plaster walls, white plaster walls, overhanging balcony, red tile roof. Um, here's our, our caves with our arches made out of stone or concrete tile floors, uh, 
decorative uh, wrought iron work here, uh, courtyards with fountains and um, tile, etc. And it's a little nod with some classical detailing and a, a small espadana uh, over the entryway. And then in many homes, there were so many around the state, it was hard to choose one over the other. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I apologize for not having clearer photographs, but it was the best I could do uh, in a pinch. But the wonderful Casa del Herrero by George Washington Smith, again in Santa Barbara. Now, the Santa Barbara version by Smith is really looking at um, rural vernacular elements of the Spanish farmhouse. So you're going to see very uh, vast amounts of blank wall with uh, windows punctuating it very small and very sparsely. And your uh, ornamental details centering just on the doorway here with the very simple uh, iron balcony. The arcades are uh, out in the yard uh, providing these outdoor rooms. And then, of course, the back opens up here to a, um, a pool. You can tell this is a, a delightful California-style home. The multiple volumes of shed roofs, gabled roofs, uh, arcades and loggias, giving us the indoor-outdoor space. Uh, and here's an additional garden space. So really pulling the house out into the yard and um, locking it into the landscape with vegetation. Here's a, a loggia with a series of arched windows on turned columns. Uh, so a mixture of classical detailing and these very blank walls. Monterey Revival. Uh, from the sublime to the uh, more or less vernacular, uh, again, almost a straight rendition using more modern materials of what we saw earlier in Monterey. The character-defining feature here is this second-story uh, cantilevered balcony, uh, almost always in wood uh, with very simple detailing here on the railings. Uh, a more exalted version of the Monterey Revival by noted architect Roland Cote, who did all sorts of fancy revival homes for the Hollywood Hoi Polloi in Los Angeles in the 1920s. Uh, you can see the balcony running across the entire front of the house, the uh, overhanging tiled roof supported on porch uh, wooden post, and then these wonderful beefy beams carrying through the living room, uh, wood plank floor, uh, here's our windows, so sort of a mixture, again, the beams uh, are very simple staircase, this looks like it may want to be outdoors, and then the uh, arched loggia, uh, open air on the second floor, some wonderful elements, the turned um, spindle work here in the outdoor opening in the tile floor. Elements, Monterey Revival, fairly similar to the Spanish Colonial Revival. Now the colonial, Spanish Colonial Revival feeds into the Colonial Revival. Not real popular in Southern California um, and not really uh, the rest of the state either. But here are two great examples of uh, film or, or buildings associated with the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. Now, once oil is discovered in Los Angeles, once the film industry discovers the great weather in Los Angeles, once the aerospace industry discovers the great weather, Los Angeles becomes the state capital for architecture. And influences now begin f uh, flowing into LA from all over the world and then being mixed in this creative crucible of all of the talent coming into LA for these various commercial, industrial, and entertainment enterprises and then being disseminated out toward the rest of the world. 
So we can see the power of the film in the music industry in these two colonial revival statements from the 1930s. And if you think of Mount Vernon, you on steroids, that's pretty much what you'll be uh, getting. These were influenced a lot by the uh, rehabilitation of Williamsburg by the Rockefellers in the 1930s. And a, a general interest in going back to our American roots during the Depression. Uh, other revival styles, which I'm going to go through very quickly because I'd really like to spend the remaining time talking about modernism. Tudor revival, some very uh, pedestrian uh, examples here in uh, San Diego. French eclectic, uh, brought in by our boys in Europe with the uh, witch's turret uh, tower, the very steep cat slide roof. We have dovecoats, plain walls, some um, projecting windows, very tall chimneys, and incorporation of your uh, wooden uh, half timbering as well. Makes these statements quite um, elegant. Again, uh, done by fancy architects in LA for the Hollywood community and the more pedestrian versions around the corner from my neighborhood. Art Deco, coming in in the 1920s and 30s, a version of modernism that is uh, streamlining and stripping the detailing down to a bare minimum, flattening it out, moving with very shiny service surfaces and highly stylized ornament. Here, phenomenally detailed at night, very dramatically at Bullock's Wilshire. Uh, you can see that step pattern here with the very tall central tower. The windows organized in bands with decorative recessed panels between them. This is the ooh -ah portion of the presentation. Art Deco, very popular in theaters here at the Paramount Theater in Oakland. Interior lobby, we're starting to get neon and backlighting. And then in the auditorium, where you get a good close-up of that very flat, stylized detailing, combination of geometric, vegetal, and animal motifs. Streamline Modern, another manifestation of modernism. We're creeping toward uh, getting rid of all ornament. Uh, this based very much on the concepts of speed and uh, looking at things such as ship design and trains. Uh, we have a land yacht here at the Maritime Museum in San Francisco. It was originally a bathhouse built by the WPA and it has all of the character defining features one would expect of the style. It's sleek, it's smooth, it has rounded corners, horizontal windows, horizontal pipe railing. Uh, as someone might say, it's totally tubular. And we're going to get some port windows with this as well. And very flat, colorful tile work design. WPA Modern, another style from the, the 1930s and the Depression, associated most often with government buildings. Here a modest version in the post office at St. Helena. It's often referred to as starved classicism, where you can see uh, the, these piers stripped to their minimum with very um, almost no capitals, no bases, uh, the fluting completely gone, and everything flattened out. They have very smooth, polished surfaces, and then bas-relief sculpture with uh, very patriotic themes. This was mostly used by uh, the government in their buildings, and you can see some of the decorative motifs here uh, looking at the way the mail is transferred from the, from the writer to the recipient. 
minimal traditional, another stripped version of the, um, the more uh, European styles, that the revival styles from the 20s, here in the 30s being pared back and miniaturized for affordable housing for the middle class. Now the last major component here is the California Ranch. Uh, this again is statewide and I'm only going to show one example by the man who invented the style, Cliff May. Uh, this was done for informal living, had a huge family emphasis, so you can see a lot of the, the detail here on the backyard, not the front yard. We're going to have long, horizontal, sprawling frontages on suburban lots. Uh, in Cliff's versions, these are single room deep, like they were in our earliest ranchos, and we're going to have a lot of outdoor spaces and, of course, a lot of room for our cars. So we have a motor court here two garages, and this was originally a rancho, so we have uh, some horse property as well. Here's the rear patio. We have an emphasis on indoor-outdoor living. Uh, the initial version in the 1930s and then in the late 40s when he removed the closed windows and added sliding glass doors to access his backyard and extended the hardscape to create a, a phenomenally huge patio. There's a extended view of the backyard, outdoor rooms, uh, indoor outdoor space as you can see here, uh, built around these mature sycamore trees. Uh, now, the, the ranch was really the most popular version of modernism because it was warm and fuzzy. The more pure version was the international style introduced by Richard Neutra and Rudolf Schindler into Los Angeles in the 1920s. Here's the international style essay by Richard Neutra in the Lovell Health House where we have a strict machine aesthetic with extremely simplified forms, all the ornaments stripped off, no roof, um, horizontal banded windows, sheathed in white stucco, and uh, very machined um, materials. Now the last uh, slide I would like to share with you, and I don't know what happened, we skipped to the end, is um, two versions of modernism in California that show the ways the various parts of the state have gone or were about going around 1960. Uh, here at Sea Ranch we have what was affectionately referred to as Mineshaft Modern, uh, which was Charles Moore's first attempt at looking at indigenous California barns again and creating a modern essay here, very, very planar, similar to what we saw in the Lovell Health House, but in wood. So it's very woodsy and very sort of friendly and comforting and domestic in scale. Versus the Southern California example by Philip Johnson here at the Crystal Cathedral, which is all machined and glazed a huge space frame, enormous spaces, and um, very machine. So this is where the state was going in 1960. We'd embraced modernism, we'd stripped everything you could off these buildings, but the North and the South had split and decided to go their, their different ways. Los Angeles with the international style and high modernism, San Francisco back to its roots, in what we call the Third Bay Area tradition, keeping with the woodsy feel that started with the arts and crafts. So I'll stop it here and I'll see if there are any questions. Thank you for your attention. 
Okay, if you have any questions, make sure that you send them in through the toolbar, uh, the question option at the right of your screen. We have a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, Diane, there was a question about the beginning of your presentation. You mentioned a couple of names. Could you repeat the names, Dr. Gephardt, and then there was a second person that was named in the beginning of your presentation? Hmm. Good question. I don't recall. Okay. <laughs> if I could have a little bit of a hint, maybe I could remember yeah. what the context was. Yeah, there were just uh, there were a couple uh, a couple of names. Someone mentioned uh, Andrew Jackson Downing, perhaps. Um, Anyway, it'll come to you, and then we'll we'll get that information over to the person that asked the question. Second was um, the title of Dr. Gephardt's guidebooks. Could you mention those? Ah, yes, uh, they're very simple. One is Architecture in San Francisco and Northern California, and the other is a guide to architect. Uh, I'm sorry, and the other one is I think a guide to architecture in. Los Angeles and Southern California. Okay. Um, someone also mentioned that perhaps the name that was mentioned at the beginning was McAllister and McAllister. Oh, yes, McAllister and McAllister, a field guide to um, looking, trying to see it on my bookshelf. I've got my the wrong glasses on. If you can indulge me a minute, I will go get the complete citation. Okay. There was also a question about the materials for today's <coughs> webinar. That is, yeah, a field guide to American houses by Virginia and Lee McAllister, and that is spelled M C A L E S T E R. Okay. Um, Diane, there was a, a question about the availability of the slides for handouts. Can we um, get those as PDFs and send those off to the attendees? Cindy, you and I will have to work on that. We will do whatever we can to accommodate them. Okay, absolutely. Um, do you have any other questions from our, from our audience? Well, I'm pleased to say we had a very good uh, attendance today, and with just very few exceptions, everyone's still on. So if you do have questions, make sure you send them in to us. Um, there's a question here about um, Sea Ranch. Is Sea Ranch the beginning of the shed style? Yes. Uh, when that first came out, it was referred to as Mineshaft Modern. and People really weren't sure how to uh, how to cope with it. I guess it was it was so stripped and so um, different from anything people had seen prior to that that it really left people kind of shocked. Um, I remember this quite vividly because I was a student up in Berkeley at the time, where Charles Moore was teaching in the architecture school, and the um, I, I don't. What I what I would like to say is that at the time people really weren't sure how to classify it because it was so new. Looking at it from a lens of maybe 40 years, this was one of the seminal buildings in postmodernism, because what postmodernism did was look at history, and it did in somewhat of a jokey way initially, but. Another component of postmodernism was preservation. So you have in the Bay Area at about the same time two really groundbreaking projects that kicked off postmodernism. One is Sea Ranch, the other is Ghirardelli Square, where that entire Victorian complex was repurposed and turned into a commercial. Of, you know what they call what festival retail space. That was a concept nobody had thought of up to that point. And Ghirardelli Square was just this rotting com complex of industrial detritus on the bay that nobody knew what to do with. So 
I think both of these projects in the Bay Area, again, put San Francisco in the forefront of what was to be the next phase setting up for the next 30 years. And this is the phase we're still in right now. And Charles Moore was right at the, at the cutting edge of both of those um, trends. Now, Southern California goes in a very different way uh, with modernism. So we have the case study houses, which is in this, in this uh, presentation. We just didn't have time for it. But during the 50s and the 60s, there was a real push for modern design in San Diego, where you have the very high style stuff being pushed by Arts and Architecture magazine in the case study house program which is taking place in Los Angeles, but the magazine is read all over uh, California. And you see modernism spreading from Los Angeles to San Diego, to Santa Barbara, and to other points around the state. And this very hard-edged industrial strength um, version of it, not the softy, woodsy stuff you get up in the Bay Area. So you have that happening in the 60s. But at the same time, you have Frank Gehry coming along, playing around with his version of postmodernism, which eventually becomes what we today call deconstructivism. And he is working with these very uh, nondescript stucco box buildings that we have by the by the carload in Los Angeles and hacking into them and you know, cutting them up and rearranging the spaces in all sorts of outrageous ways. So he was destroying buildings in order to recreate them, or as Charles Moore is taking uh, you know, very humble materials and doing these straight-sided things um, up in the Bay Area. So both guys are working with dumb box buildings, but they're doing very different things with them. And then as you, um, you have deconstructivism happening in LA, you also have late modernism with these sleek skinned buildings such as the Pacific Design Center, uh, the Bonaventure Towers, um, and so forth that uh, feed into a, a, a later version of modernism in Los Angeles. And then just this recurring um, wonderful, elegant, modern style that you see, plus popular versions such as Tiki and um, um, uh, I'm sorry, Tiki and Googie, which are also coming out of LA. So that's sort of the rest of the lecture. <laughs> um, I really, for those of you who are doing survey work, I would really love to see some of your uh, names for some of these buildings. Uh, there are so many interesting things that you run into today as you're running about doing field work that, um, that many of them do not have names. And that, that's one of the things I like about David's work is he was doing field research so early that people had not decided what to call a lot of the buildings he detailed in his guidebooks. So he does very nice descriptions of them in the back. Uh, today we've, we've broken out some of these and refined them. And the, some of the terms that I was using were, were from the Gallister and the Gallister. Some of them are from other sources. Some of them are ones that I have just felt comfortable with after doing about 40 years worth of field work. And they may be called different things in other parts of the state. But that's what makes it so exciting. That you, as people who are in this field, we get to make it up as we go. Hmm. Okay, well, we have one minute left, and we have about five questions that have been asked. Oh, all right. Yeah, uh, five additional questions. So I would propose that um, we answer these questions. We'll list them and then answer them and send them to everyone. Um, I don't think we're going to have enough time to go through everything here. Um, so well, can I make a, may I make a brief announcement about sure. the follow-up webinar? Mm -hmm. I was very frustrated in putting this together because I didn't have enough time to include everything I would like to include. And one of those is how you, when you are, how you write an architectural description. How do you actually decide what style a building is? Because while I was showing you fairly pure examples, most of what you will encounter if you're out in the field is not pure. So 
I have a whole exercise on how you figure out how to start, how, you, how to name something and how to describe it. And we'll be doing a follow-up webinar on that in the near future. Okay, well, I would like to thank you, Diane, and everyone who's attending the webinar for participating in this today. We will be sending out a list of the unanswered or unasked questions with some answers and sending off a handout of today's presentation. So thank you all for attending. Thank you for supporting the California Preservation Foundation.